of what we're saying now, that, that kind of framework, assumes that these sensory information is always going to be perfectly reliable. So if there's a, a prediction error, that must be because the sensory information is correct, but the model must be wrong. Welcome to the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home for wants and solutions to $64,000 questions. I'm your host, Dr. Tedo Chikoso. Among today's $64,000 questions are, one, realities are constructed by our brain. Does dimethyltryptamine or ayahuasca make the brain construct a different reality? Or does it make the brain perceive a different reality based on the information that it is receiving? Number two, LSD, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, scopolamine, salvinoin, and ketamine. These molecules switch your reality from one channel to another. How do they do it? Number three, why is the fly agaric psychedelic? Or why do some molecules that stimulate the GABA-A receptor have psychedelic effects? Giving his one cent solutions is our guest, Dr. Andrew Gallimore. Dr. Andrew Gallimore is a neurobiologist, chemist, pharmacologist, and writer interested in the relationship between psychedelic drugs, the brain, consciousness, and the structure of reality. He is British and is based in Tokyo, Japan. He has written a couple of books that he also illustrated and self-published. In 2019, he released the book entitled Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies, and the Cosmic Game, mainly about dimethyltryptamine or DMT. In 2022, he released the book entitled Reality Switch Technologies, Psychedelics as Tools for Discovery and Exploration of New Worlds mainly about molecules that shift reality channels like LSD, DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, scopolamine, salvinolin, and ketamine. Hi, we have with us uh, Dr. Andrew Gallimore. And um, from our um, credentials, it seems that the only place where we differ is the fact that he has a PhD in chemistry and I have a doctor of medicine. And I was a computational neurobiologist, or identified as such, in 1988, way before anyone identified himself as a <laughs> computational neurobiologist. But I was actually um, uh, taking students under PhD dissertations on computational neurobi uh, uh, neurobiology. Um, and um, uh, as you know, I, 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 uh, I wrote a book on the uh, connectome of C. elegans based on the um, uh, electromicrographs made by Sidney Brenner, right? And he won his Nobel. Mm -hmm. I got an index card saying, thank you very much for all of your work. Uh, but then the book didn't take off until about six years ago when a researcher said, uh, uh, asked me uh, for a copy of the book. And I said, what's the interest? Why are so many people asking me? Apparently, there's already a name for it. It's called Connectome. So when the OMIC system mm -hmm. began, the neural circuitry database is now the connector. <laughs> but, but, yes. but anyway, um, um, I, I, I just have a, uh, since I, I'm in medicine and I created a new specialty, uh, clinical specialty called health optimization medicine. And we uh, basically detect and correct imbalances at the level of metabolome. Now, I was presenting this to physicians and healthcare practitioners one time in San Francisco, and I actually got a very difficult question from a shrink. He said, well, Dr. Ted, how do you include spirituality in the health optimization medicine framework? And I said, you know, I got to think quickly, and I said, well, you know, DMT is the spirit molecule, right? So then lack of spirituality is the DMT deficiency syndrome. So give them DMT and be done mm. with it. <laughs> so that, <laughs> that, that was a DMT deficiency syndrome uh, answer. Now, uh, Andrew, you uh, wrote Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies and the Cosmic Game by uh, Strange Worlds Press in February 2019. I understand you're all self-published, right? All of this book are self-published? It's not only self-published. Yeah, so I, I write, I design, I typeset, and I publish everything at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I, it's beautiful. Um, you know, I, I read the alien information theory on, uh, uh, on, a, on a laptop, but 
uh, the second one, which we're going to discuss uh, later, reality switch technologies. I I had a guest here um, and said, mm. Ted, take a look at this book. It's everything that you wanted to see in a psychedelic manual. <laughs> and, and so I actually read it uh, through overnight because he was leaving the next day and I finished the book. But I, the, the illustrations really grabbed me, right? Uh, and I understood uh, you know exactly where you're coming from as a computational neurobiologist with a lot of programming and mathematics mm. and, and so on, uh, which was so much fun. Yes, yes. But um, um, I'd like to thank, tell my audience, guys, Andrew can write. He can hold your attention yeah. in a book. You know, yeah. forget about his all other credentials. He writes beautifully. So I'm going to read something at the back cover of Alien Information Theory uh, just to show you. Uh, he says... At the ground of our reality, there is a code running. It is a code from which this universe and countless others emerge and unfold with infinite variety of form. This code constructs our universe as a computational device for culturing conscious intelligence. We are one of those intelligences emergent with this lower dimensional digital reality. As intelligences evolve, a small number reach a certain level of cognitive and technological sophistication and become candidates for a cosmic game, the final stages of which we now find ourselves playing. The key to this game is a technology embedded in our reality, which takes the form of a powerful psychedelic drug, a message scattered throughout the natural world, and dimethyltryptamine DMT. When DMT enters the brain, it grants entry to a miraculously complex hyperdimensional realm, hyperspace, lying orthogonal to ours and to an audience with the multitudinous alien intelligences that reside therein. That is some fantastic <laughs> piece of writing. And it really encapsulates the, the, um, the DMT experience. I have to ask you before we dive into mm. the, that beautiful uh, uh, praise of the book is, you know, were you yourself a subject of the DMTX, uh, uh, participating subject in the DMTX uh, experiments? No, unfortunately not. I'm, I, I'm residing in, in Tokyo and it's, um, it's difficult for me to kind of contribute physically to these kind of things. So, so no, I unfortunately, I think all of the subjects were pretty much um, over in the UK at uh, kind of um, around Imperial College London. So unfortunately, I, I've never actually experienced the full DMTX protocol yet. Yet. Perhaps in the future when it's, it's more established, because this first study that they did was very much a kind of a small pilot study. Mm -hmm. So it was a small clutch of selected participants who were, I think, really quite experienced, um, not only with DMT, but often with taking psychedelics in a experimental setting, because that's obviously quite different, um, particularly yeah. when they're taking functional MRI scans oh, on I you. I see, I see. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very challenging environment, I think. So I'm not even sure how well equipped I would be to handle that kind of experience, you know. Well, so to, I will wait. To be able to hold you in that particular uh, hyperspace, you know, for a uh, mm. you know, prolonged period of time, that is an accomplishment in itself. And you work with uh, Rick Strassman on that, right? And, um, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I remember one of his uh, books where he wrote, I'm sure you read it, uh, Inner Journeys, uh, Inner Paths to Outer Space. Um, Inner Paths to Outer, outer Space. space. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, where, you know, uh, that's, that's one of the uh, books that I, I was, that I actually uh, read uh, coming from different authors. And, um, and I was one of those who got invited to an uh, ayahuasca journey like, 30 years ago but said no and then 30 years later uh, said okay um uh yeah. i can you know i can now extract this in my kitchen <laughs> and in my kitchen yes. in my kitchen in an island not in the united states okay so <laughs> let's just put it that way yeah. um and uh, i developed you know a pharma protocol uh you know uh, mm. for it 
and that's where my uh, my uh, journey and research and experiences with uh, DMT began. And what I was uh, looking at when when uh, uh, you with what you wrote is that you know in this where you know the experience of machine elves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it, it's really quite fun because there was one time when I actually had those mischievous elves. You know, uh, they were actually they felt like they were eating through my body. You know, it's like doing this. Mm. It's like climbing through, yeah, etc. Yeah. And it was fun. It was like. Um, you know, it was like harmless fun, uh, but it was very playful. And in that, um, um, uh, in the statement that you made, like uh, it, it's it's actually Grant's entry to the complex hyperdimensional space, and from there mm. builds this certain uh, complex world, right? And you know, it, it reminded me uh, a lot of uh, John Conway's Game of Life, and of, um, mm -hmm. you know, Stephen Wolfram's, uh, uh, you know, A New Kind of Science. You know, can you, uh, you know, can you um, um, uh, explain to us how this basically informed your, uh, your writing about uh, uh, this uh, particular subject? Yeah, so I used Conway's Game of Life simply because it's a, um, a simple digitally um, instantiated program, a very simple uh, computationally instantiated program um, that is fundamentally just very, very small, um, simple binary um, units that can exist in, in Conway's Game of Life in one of two states. Yeah. And through very simple rules of interaction. You've basically got four rules mm -hmm. with Conway's Game, game mm -hmm. of Life. How does the state of each of these units, what we call cells, um, different to living cells, mm -hmm. but just simple squares basically on the Game of Life, through very, four very simple rules of interaction, um, update rules they're called, you, you see these marvelous patterns of complexity mm -hmm. emerge. Um, and so this is, it's a great way to show people how you can start at the fundamental level of reality with a very, very, a very, very simple system, a very, very, very simple fundamental set of, um, uh, of rules governing the interaction between whatever there is at the ground of reality. And from that, you get this emergence from the ground upwards with layers of increasingly complex, um, hierarchically organized systems that culminates at the very top of the hierarchy with living beings like ourselves. So the idea basically is that we emerge, we emerge over time through the instantiation of this fundamental code. I call it the code mm -hmm. of the ground of reality. The computational system that lies at the ground of our reality from which all emerges, including ultimately us. highly complex conscious beings like us. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Conway's, I don't think that uh, our life is an instantiation just of Conway's game of life. Yeah. Um, but it, it illustrates, you know, yeah. obviously that's, yeah. that's a very simple cellular automaton. Did you yeah. ever run it, the, the code in, in your lab? Because I was running it, uh, you know, he's, he's out mm. of Princeton. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you could see this beautiful, like, uh, after so many thousands and thousands or millions of iterations, you could see what looks like birds flying, mm. and you could see, like, trees forming, and so on, just from those four fucking rules, man. It's just so Four incredible. fucking yeah. rules. Yeah. Yes. And they're still discovering that there's a whole online community that still exists um, that actually look for new patterns in the game of life. Yes. So this is not something it was invented. Oh, God, when was it? In the 1980s, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. yeah. Originally, John Conway published it in a magazine. And this was before it was programmed into a computer. And, and he would have literally squares on like a table, like a chessboard, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he would, and he would, uh, you would update it manually, mm -hmm. you know, working out yeah. 
and then you would start to see these patterns emerging. But now, of course, you can do millions of iterations yeah, in a second yeah, right. on, on, a, on a fast computer. Right. Uh, but still, although all that time later, people are still discovering new patterns yeah. that no one had ever seen before. Because it's an infinite board. You right. have infinite space, mm -hmm. basically, in all directions, mm -hmm. in all four directions, in this two-dimensional plane. Uh, and so people are still finding and giving names. I mean, it started with the glider, you know, these, mm -hmm. these right, five right, cells that, right. that tend to kind of glide right. across the screen. Then people started seeing spaceships, which are mm -hmm. larger structures, yeah. sort of chug. Yeah. Yeah. And then they started having spaceships that, guns, yeah. so spaceships that would <laughs> right, fire right. guns that then would interact with other critters, or I call in the book critters, uh, other uh, uh, structures on the board and make them explode effectively right. or, or join together and form larger structures. Right. So, you, so even with this very simple system, uh, we can see the emergence of complexity. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Have, have you um, come across uh, Ian Stewart's uh, books? Uh, he's a British mathematician. He, so with with, yes, with course, one, yeah. one, one simple paragraph, he sent me into like a three month depression when he said, um, you know, if you just consider yourself as just one of those pixels in the grid, right? You're one square in the grid, and there are really only four rules governing you. And all the while, you didn't know that there were only four such fucking rules, right? And then he said, he yeah. calls those grid cells, right? He calls those grid cells. Yeah. And so we discover a lot of the things that uh, the, the cells are doing. We discover the birds. We discover, you know, uh, these this other things. And he says, uh, because he used the term cell for the pixel, he said, and we give each other no cell awards for our discoveries, fully not knowing that we're really only governed by four fucking rules. And that yeah. sent me into a depression. It's like, really? You know? Who knows these rules? But anyway, you said that right. DMT provides us the key, you know, to something like this, to, to examining a word like this. How does it provide a key? Um, yeah, so that's the, the basic vision of the book, if you like, mm -hmm. is that uh, what I was trying to do with the book is trying to think, well, if this DMT reality does exist, right, mm -hmm. if, if there is some other place that you are visiting mm -hmm. or experiencing, where could it be? And one way to think about it is to imagine that our universe, our reality, is a thin slice mm. of a, uh, a, a higher dimensional structure. So we would be existing within a three plus one or four dimensional slice of a nine, 10, 11, 12, we don't know. Calabaya uh, lattice, right. maybe? <laughs> Right, something <laughs> like that, exactly, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't know. But, we would, but anyway, we would be this thin slice, much like a, uh, a 2D chessboard could be a slice of a three-dimensional cubic chessboard. And we exist, we only receive information from one slice, from our slice. Uh, but if you manipulate what's going on at the ground, if you manipulate what's going on at these, this lowest level of reality, this, this fundamental digital structure, you can alter the, um, you can alter the, the number of dimensions from which you can receive information. So the, the, the 2D chessboard can suddenly become part of the three-dimensional structure, mm -hmm. but only if it can start to receive information from the, the high dimensional structure. If, it, if, if, it, if its state does not depend upon information coming from the, the orthogonal directions, mm -hmm. uh, so up and down, then it's, it's, it's ignorant of, of, those, um, of, the, of those dimensions. But as soon as it starts receiving information, as soon as its state starts to depend upon what's going on in the up and down direction, then it effectively becomes part of that high dimensional structure. And that's what I, imagine is happening with DMT is that our, we're not just experiencing or looking into this high dimensional space. Effectively, our brain becomes a higher dimensional structure. It becomes part of this temporarily, fortunately, yes. or not fortunately, depending <laughs> on how you see it, potentially becomes part of this high dimensional structure. 
So when you enter the DMT space, you're becoming part of the DMT space. Yeah, it, that reminds me, uh, the way I, uh, uh, you know, I, I hear you is that I remember the book Flatland, right? And so we are yes, exactly. in our daily reality Flatlanders. We get visited by Lord Sphere and all we see are concentric circles, right? And you get, right. the, and, and then you get DMT and you see, holy shit, you know, there's a three-dimensional structure out there that's actually just penetrating through, you know, this uh, uh, flatland. And that's why we see all we see. Exactly. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Exactly. So we always see our circles, but when you take DMT, it's like shifting, becoming part of that three-dimensional space. Yeah, from being in two-dimensional. So then you, yeah, you could actually see a um, a sphere or something, right? Yeah. And that would, of course, be confounding to you. You would go, "That's impossible." Mm. You know, you, your experience would. You would say, "That's not." There's no fucking way that just happened. Yeah. This object cannot exist. Right. And that's what happens when you take DMT. You go to this high dimensional space and your response is, this is impossible. There's no way mm. these objects could exist right. because they can't exist within our three plus one dimensional world, but they can exist in the high dimensional you, space. You mentioned, um, uh, you know, I listened to some of the other people you talked to, and it's also what I've noticed, uh, with the people that have taken journeys is that they uh, mm. actually see the same things uniformly with DMT, right? Uh, they are brought to the same spaces, they see the same thing. So there is a certain uniformity uh, uh, of what they bring back mm. uh, into conscious experience. So does that account for something like for us to suspect that this, this is a separate uh, dimension out there that we're from which we're drawing information from or uh, you know, um, uh, is that just a way of the brain uh, actually trying to make sense of something that uh, external, but with a different uh, channel on? You know, you know, how do we think about that? Yeah, we have to be very careful. I think it's a mixture because, as I always say, uh, I'm always very keen to point out uh, is that the whenever we experience a world, it has to be constructed by our brain. Mm -hmm. You can't experience a world unless it's being constructed by our brain. Right. So if we want to, even if there is some other high dimensional space, some other world, some other reality, some other universe, whatever you want to call it, uh, within which these beings reside and exist and live, mm -hmm. um, the only way we can experience that world is if our brain builds a model of it. Our brain has to be able to model that reality. Uh, it receives information from that reality in the form, some kind of alternate form of sensory information, if you like. But the brain still has to build a model of it. Mm -hmm. And that applies even during waking life. We know your, your brain is always trying to make sense of, to, to build the most adaptive functional model um, uh, of the environment using noisy patterns of sensory information right. from the environment. So even during waking life, we, we can't say this is what the world really looks like. Uh, all we can say is this model of the world that my brain is building works. It's adaptive. It's functional. Um, so, so the same would apply in the DMT space. I would never say this is exactly what the DMT space is. Mm. Or what this is what it looks like. This is its true nature. We can never say that. Right. What we can say is, um, or what we can try to, the question we can try to answer is, is this model that my brain has suddenly started constructing in the presence of DMT, when we take DMT, is this model somehow being modulated and informed by information from some other place? Mm. Is there some other... It could be a high dimension or orthogonal dimension. It could be uh, an, an entirely different universe in a location that we simply have no comprehension of. We don't know. Um, but what we can say is that um, if it does exist, the only way for us to experience it is for um, the brain to construct a model of it using the information drawn from that space. So um, have you taken IV DMT? No, no, only smoke, only smoke. vaporized, okay. vaporized. Have you uh, yeah. done pharmawaska at all? No, um, I've never done pharmawaska. I mean, I'm, I've been familiar with pharmawaska for many years. I mean, ever since 
ayahuasca became kind of popularized, people have been trying to find alternate uh, techniques for achieving the same kind of state without having to drink the ayahuasca brew, which is pretty unpleasant. Um, no, I um, actually developed it for myself because I said, I don't want to puke. And this is from the MOI, yeah, exactly. from the MAOI inhibition. There's a reason for the dieta mm. for two weeks and, and so on and so forth. So I developed something where I will not throw up. Uh, and, you know, the only uh, requirement that I have for myself is, you know, a four hour fast before you, you, uh, you take it. Mm. But um, now you begin, you begin the, uh, the process. But what's, uh, uh, what has been your experience uh, personally while uh, on mm. the um, uh, 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 DMT? Uh, well, many. I mean, I've had many experiences. Um, have I met elves? I mean, my, my typical experience is, curiously, I've taken it many times. Uh, I don't know how many, but many. Um, curiously, my experience every single time is the same, almost the same level of shock and astonishment. Um, and then a strong sense of um, familiarity, like, ah, yeah. here we are again. Yeah. There's the, the DMT space is now I can't imagine really what it's like, the geometry. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I, can't, I can't picture it in my head, but as soon as I smoke it, instantly ah i'm yeah, back yeah, yeah it has this very familiar entirely yeah. unique familiar um signature right? um, structure yeah. and yes yeah. yes it has this its own particular geometric hyperdimensional Original. signature yeah. Yeah. Um, that is very from the first time i took it um which was maybe 20 years ago mm -hmm. now um instantly as i was flying, being hurtled through this procession of highly complex structure, um, my brain said, this is intelligent. This is constructed. Mm -hmm. um, I knew in my head, this is not just um, visual hallucination. These are not entoptics mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, eidetic hallucinations. Mm -hmm. This is intelligent complexity. This is highly intelligent, constructed, inorganic complexity. Um, that I knew from the very moment that, that I very first, and that's in a way, that was the most horrifying uh, and awe, awe, I can't say awe striking, that's not a word, but uh, awe inspiring. <laughs> awe inspiring. Uh, that, that's the, that, was, that was the thing that really shook me uh, was that that not that just that I could experience such complexity, but that, that this complexity, this place that is far more complex, far more rich mm -hmm. um, than our existence is, has been there. It's there. It's always been there. It's been there much longer, I think, than our universe has been here. Um, and that shocked me that there was this extremely powerful, uh, hyper-intelligent, hyper-intelligent sitting there uh, that had been constructing this reality for trillions or quadrillions of years or whatever. And, it, and, and I was just discovering it. That terrified me, that aspect of it. Before I got to seeing entities or exploring the space, just that moment of realization of what I was dealing with. Mm. I think that was it for me. The confrontation with the undeniability of this space. Uh, that is, that's the most shocking and, 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 and it, horrifying uh, part of the DMT experience. Yeah, it, it, in a way, that was the same for me. I've said that the first time I, I uh, had the experience of ayahuasca, it was like having a rug pulled up from under me. And everything yeah. that I believe in was just upended. And the first thing that yeah. um, the, the first and most frightening for me 
was that was this realization there are other dimensions out there right yeah for, for yeah. you know uh, uh which are unavailable to us when in ordinary waking life right uh yeah. that are otherwise available with these types of molecules and uh, that sort of like um uh, uh pushed me uh to to uh, like you you know investigate what's happening like and, and for me, it's more mm. like, why the fuck do we have these molecules, you know, around? Yeah. <laughs> like, why are they there? Um, it's like, so, you know, have you, have you, um, uh, you know, Donald Hoffman wrote a book, Case Against Reality, and I don't know if you've read it, mm. but yes, in, in, in there, you know, we've, we, we corresponded a little bit, and he's very much enamored by the work of Nimar Kani Hamed, right? Uh, where Nimar Khan Ahmed is, a, is a, uh, the guy who's saying, well, space time is doomed. And, you know, with, uh, uh, with the discovery of uh, ampl the amplitohedron and, you know, the cosmological epitope that he was talking about. Um, it, and, it, and, you know, I, I even had the, the picture of the amplitohedron sort of like as my, my, um, uh, <laughs> my phone uh, uh, screen for a number of years before anyone paid attention uh, to it, right? Who did it possible that these geometries that you're talking about are existing beyond mm. space-time? Yeah, so Don Hoffman was, I always like to say that I was reading Don Hoffman before he, before he was famous. You know, people <laughs> say, have you read The Case of Against Reality? I go, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was, I, was, I was reading Hoffman mm -hmm. way before but what I, what's most important for me, what uh, that I got from Don Hoffman's work was this idea, basically that we don't see reality as it is, mm -hmm. um, and not only do we not see reality as it is, there's no way for us to, and nor is it necessarily adaptive right. to see truth, um, and that's very important. When you when you when you have that realization. Um, then everything opens up. You, you start to lose um, your reliance on appearance and focus more on, well, for me anyway, it turned my uh, attention inwards and think, okay, we can kind of forget about, not forget, we can accept, yes, there's information, sensory information coming from outside, from the environment, but we don't have to focus too much on whether it's true, or whether it's correct, uh, whether it's real that awful word, mm -hmm. um, whether it's real, but we can focus on the model. Um, and that really opened up, um, not just Don Hoffman's work, but others as well, but opened up the idea that we can, we can focus on uh, the construction of the model and how that model is being constructed and how that model can be um, perturbed, mm -hmm. how you can shift from constructing one model to another. So, you know, with DMT, your brain is, cons you perturb the brain with this simple molecule and for reasons that we don't quite understand, um, but that, that I think about a lot, is this perturbation causes the brain to start constructing an entirely different, different model, a model that normally bears no relationship whatsoever to the model it's evolved to build. Right. This adaptive model, that it's been refining and honing over millions of years, um, suddenly it starts building this completely different model that has more dimensions. Um, so, sorry, I've, I've lost track of your original question, but yeah, that's why, um, yeah, it's, go on. No, 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 yeah, no, it's all right, because um, while, while you were talking, it reminded me, like Donald Hoffman was saying, well, we're actually honed for fitness function, right? Uh, you know, uh, for, for survival and yes. production, and that's all that we see. Right. And people and, and in his models, you mm. know, which he was running, it's like those who see those who see the transistors and everything else that go inside the computer, they die out first rather than those who actually use the software. So uh, because uh, one, you know, he and he considers, um, you know, the body as a simple interface right uh, to this particular dimension, mm. uh, which is actually that's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a we were an interface. Um, uh, that this whole thing is an interface. And the last statement that he gave in his book, uh, which was actually um, uh, left me pondering, is that what if you're playing um, volleyball, right? And you're playing volleyball, et cetera, et cetera. And then you suddenly uh, felt so thirsty and you, you, you take out your VR suit, it's like, and 
you go for a drink. And he says, who's coming out of the VR suit to go for a drink? So mm. that was a, a kind of interesting way of uh, putting things uh, in, in perspective as regards, you know, what we're seeing when we're in a, when, when we are in a DMT experience. Now, the, uh, the other um, mm. uh, I think that uh, I, I wanted to uh, place in there was that, you know, in terms of our brain constructing like uh, uh, all, all of this, you you were we were talking about the uh, you know that we were honing this this uh, brain as a predictive uh, predictive machine, right? Uh, it just predicts, mm. and it makes a lot of um, uh, it's, uh, you know again goes back to the auto generative models. Like we continue generating models all the time, mm. and that's why we're beset with so much so many thoughts all the time and none of them are real they're just being put out by our program mm -hmm. in there that we shall call the auto automatic uh, thought generator right it just it just puts in all of the things like oh this is the way you catch the ball this is why you run your business and so on and so forth and it's just going there all the time but none of them are uh, mm -hmm. uh, are actually real but then when you get into the dmt space all of that just, just quiets down and is just removed from the equation altogether because they're irrelevant, mm. right? Uh, yes. And the, the fact of their irrelevance, I think, says something to, to us. You know, uh, you know, uh, we, you know uh, this has been, this has been um, uh, romanticized as the ego death or something. Um, what do you have to say to that in terms of like, yes, you know, DMV is being used for ego death. Um, is DMT being used for ego death? I think what's interesting for me um, with DMT is that, um, firstly, Terence McKenna used to say that in constructing the DMT world, nothing is taken from this world. Um, it's, it's, it's as if the brain is using entirely different data structures. It's using entirely different pieces to construct this alternate reality. Um, that in itself is somewhat confounding because the brain really should only know how to construct one particular model of reality, mm. um, which is the normal waking world. Uh, and so it's it's, it's difficult to explain for me, and this is really what got me started thinking about DMT and, and it's the kind of the neurological underpinnings, what's actually going on in the brain when you take DMT, is the fact that the brain is able to construct this alternate model. It doesn't seem to have evolved to adaptively construct this model, um, which is the only reason that we can think of that the brain constructs the normal waking world model is as an adaptive functional model of the environment. It allows us to navigate and to survive and flourish and reproduce in whatever is out there, uh, which this, this noumenal space we call the environment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the adaptive model. So then the question is, what, how does the brain know? How did it evolve? How did it learn? How is it capable of constructing these very consistent um, models of this al alternate reality that bears no relationship to the normal waking world. H how did that happen? So that, to me, is confounding. Also, uh, going back to the ego thing, I think one of the striking things about DMT that separates it from other psychedelics and certainly other psychoactive drugs, other intoxicating or narcotic, uh, whatever you want to call them, drugs, is that the, the Terence McKenna again used to say, in a way, it doesn't affect your mind. It leaves your ability to navigate and explore and um, observe the space intact. Uh, you are not confused. You are confused, but in a, in a true sense of confusion, like what's happening? You, you get to ask those questions. If you're truly in a state of delirium, for example, um, you might not even be capable of formulating a question, what the fuck is going on? Mm -hmm. And that's also what one of the, with DMT, it's like it doesn't touch that. It's like those 
parts of your those this kind of the frontal, the critical um, parts of your brain that are the kind of the executive function, if you like, mm -hmm. that is able to look around and go, what's going on in here, is left intact. So you're still able to experience the most bizarre, unimaginably bizarre world that you could never have possibly comprehended and still can't whilst you're in the experience. And yet at the same time, your mind is intact. You're not drunk. You don't feel stoned. You don't feel... Uh, um, dizzy or disoriented in a way. It's like you're, you're there. Mm -hmm. All that's happened is the reality channel has been switched. Right. Uh, and, and in a way, that makes it all the more terrifying. You're not, there's no kind of um, uh, intoxication buffer. There's none of that alcohol induced, uh, it's okay, you know, I'm just kind of, uh, like you would if you were in a slightly kind of a dreamy state. Mm -hmm. Or if you were in a dream, because in a dream, we lose that function as well. So we don't recognize when something really weird happens in a dream. Normally, unless you're a lucid dreamer, which I don't am. go. I'm, I'm lucky. Impossible. I'm lucky. Oh, that well, way. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I used to have lucid dreams since I was a little kid. I would something bad would happen. And then my I would think, oh, it's OK. It's, it's just a dream Then I would realize. But I can't do it um, intentionally. Uh, but sometimes it used to happen quite it, regularly. It, it, it's it's uh, so much fun that I actually developed the skill mm. to do it. Um, and especially um, uh, the fact that, for example, I developed this technique that when I'm seeing monsters in my dream, I used to like, run away from them, like I realized, and then mm. I intentionally just turn around and hug them. Uh, so it's, it's a different technique altogether it's like you know yeah the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah shrinks would say ask them you know no 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 i just hug them and then it just 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 disappears but anyway uh yes uh, it's, a, it's just in a lucid yes. dream it's very important that the, the mm. point that you were making yes yeah i think so because if you're in a normal dream the most bizarre things can happen and, and you don't recognize them as being odd um so in some ways yes that can be um, more terrifying because you think it's really happening, but also it, it kind of it separates you almost. There's a slight disconnect from the way you normally experience the world. Normally you experience the world and you're always looking out for, your brain is always looking out for things that are incongruous, mm -hmm. things that aren't quite right. And that's obviously an important part of your neural, neural function. Um, and in, in the DMT state, it's not like the dream state where you... Um, where you lose that function, that critical executive function, you keep it. And so, so you're there, you're still able to voice and say what is happening. My reality has just been completely switched. It has been turned around completely. There's nothing left of my old reality. And here I am, fully conscious, fully awake, more awake than I've ever been in my life fully aware of what's going on and fully able to appreciate it. Yes, there's confusion. Yes, there's shock. Yes, there's inordinate complexity so that it is disorienting in a way, but still your mind remains sharp. And that's also, um, I think, uncanny with DMT is that it leaves alone the parts of your brain you still need uh, to kind of navigate and orient yourselves and make sense of the space which is another one of those pharmacological peculiarities that DMT has, the way it's so clean. It's like a razor. It slices through your reality and just reveals a new one in such a beautifully efficient way. I, I, that's what I, 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 I call it. It's like, it's cold, right? It's like, for me, it's like a mm. cold marble. It's not emotional. It's nothing. It's just like, you know, I did... You know, for, for, for one summer, I did as a, uh, uh, my, my elective as an in autopsy pathology. And it's like, it's just like, it's with surgical precision that it disassembles you. Yes. Right? It disassembles you yes. and you leave everything behind and you're left with nothing to hold on to. I think that's, um, yes. and that is very terrifying. Um, because, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. 
you you um you uh, uh actually continue mentioning a phrase and i would like to segue now into your newest book which is released october um mm. uh third uh of uh, 2022 uh and which i had the pleasure of uh reading overnight um because it's not available wow, well done. it's not available on <laughs> uh it's not available on uh, a digital form it's on paperback uh but it's worth it because all the illustrations are incredible i uh i'm one of those people who enjoy nice circuit diagrams and what they do to, mm. the, to the gating systems Me of the brain I'm, I'm an interventional neuroradiologist so I mm. tend to close my eyes and take a look at what's happening to the brain. And then when I get into computational neurobiology, mm. like, what are the gating systems here? What patterns do all of these neurotransmitters form? Because when you infuse, for example, DMT, the other neurotransmitters are not quiescent, right? They're still, they're still mm. there. But what they're doing, we actually don't know. But what I, I want to do now, uh, as I did in the first, uh, very first book, is I would like to read now. Um, uh, how mm. the marketing blurb looks like. It also captures, I'm <laughs> sure you wrote this, but it also captures, I did, yes. <laughs> it captures elegantly what the book is about, right? Uh, so you are in possession of an exquisite machine, motions, motionlessly buoyant in the softly circulating fluids of your skull. When you said that statement, man, I was just hooked. <laughs> that, that, this is it. <laughs> this guy knows how to fucking write. Uh, a world building machine and psychedelic molecules are the tools for tuning and operating this machine. From LSD to magic mushrooms to DMT to salvia divinorum, psychedelics are used across the globe to stimulate the brain and change the nature of the subjective world. In sufficient doses, these molecules have the potential not only to alter the structure of the normal waking world, but to replace it entirely, to hurl the tripper into fantastical realms of immense complexity and strangeness, bursting with extraordinary ecologies of apparently intelligent and communicative beings. Whilst these effects seem almost impossible to comprehend, let alone explain, as our understanding the brain's activity constructs the model of our model of reality in normal waking life deepens the mechanism by which psychedelic molecules perturb its world building machinery such that entirely novel and unimaginatively bizarre worlds emerge begins to repeat itself chemical mm -hmm. pharmacologist and neurobiologist <laughs> andrew gallimore um, explains in unprecedented depth and detail how psychedelic molecules interface with the human brain, alter the structure and dynamics of the experience world, and rapidly and efficiently switch the brain's reality channel, opening up a vast number of alternate worlds for discovery and exploration. Ultimately, using both molecular and post-molecular technologies, humans will be able to enter countless different worlds at will to establish communication with beings resident therein and to engineer reality itself. This mm. is a beautiful write-up, and immediately, uh, I, I said earlier, uh, you know, it's like I said, no, 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 no. I said this is not inner path to outer space, uh, but uh, you know, it, it just made me remember that. Um, there's also, um, you know, you're familiar with Ram Das, of course. He's a uh, um, Be Here Now podcast network. He um, has a, a lecture there. He has a classic analogy for picturing the different planes of consciousness available as TV channels that we can switch back and forth to. He offers a perspective of understanding how our ego-based identity and thinking mind are separate from what Ramdas and many others identify the soul. So that was his reality switch thing was a TV channel. Uh, and, you know, uh, and, it's, and uh, I, I like the idea of inner paths to outer space that maybe shouldn't be building spaceships. We should actually be just uh, studying these molecules on how to go on inner journeys. Now, what I'd mm. like to um, to ask you here about are the different switches that you provide in there, because mm. uh, I got fascinated because um, uh, let's just take one of the switches where Salvia is a is a, 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 yeah. a member of. Uh, what, what switch is that? Is that a the, and switch? The K switch. K, K switch. 
Uh, kappa. Kappa. Yeah, yeah kappa. That's uh, it inhibits the yeah. it inhibits yeah. the uh, uh, kappa uh, opioid uh, receptor that calcium, and then this inhibits the cortex, right? And um, the one and only time, Andrew, that I swear I would ever take salvia was just one time <laughs> where where I took it. And it seemed that I was in the space for hours and I felt like a two-dimensional flat being person being rolled mm. over and over and over and over again. And then um, it's yeah. too bad there was music playing. And each time the music played, the rolling would be at a different tempo. If the music was faster, I would roll faster. If it was slower, mm. it was slower. And then my head would be extending um, uh, out of this rolled body. And I was just wanting it to stop. It's just like, stop yeah. already. And, you know, it was all of like 10 minutes. And I thought mm. I was there forever. So have you taken salvia? And can you explain yes. to us the, the switch mechanism in there? Yeah, so salvia in, so the salvinorin is the active component of, of, of salvia divinorum, this what used to be this rare Mexican um, divinatory herb that would only grow in one small region in the cloud forests of southern Mexico. This very, very rare plant that never set seed. Um, so you had to actually take cuttings of it in order to propagate it. So it's, it was so rare. Now, of course, everyone's heard of salvia and people always say, have you taken salvia? Um, that didn't used to be a common question 30 years ago because no one had heard of it. Uh, and what's, again, kind of astonishing about um, salvinorin is that it, it exists in this really rare plant. It's a one-off. It's only produced by this plant, completely different to DMT. With DMT, you find it everywhere. Mm. Everywhere you look, you can see a plant that contains DMT. This is a specialist, specialist reality. A specialist reality. It's a specialist, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really is. So, so salvinorin, it's this remarkable molecule. It's not an alkaloid like DMT and mescaline, uh, LSD, you know, the ergot alkaloids. So derived from a completely different biosynthetic pathway, from the so-called terpene pathway, um, so it, it doesn't contain nitrogen. It, it's a completely different molecule. Um, and it also it acts completely differently in the brain. So the, the classic psychedelics, they bind to these serotonin receptor subtypes, mm. specifically the 5-HT2A receptor right. uh, in deep layers of the cortex. That's how it ex exhibits uh, or exerts its effect. And we kind of understand yeah, that, that's to just, a large that's extent now that's how a that works. switch, right? The classic ones. That's the classic yeah, switch, yeah. yeah, the C-switch. Yeah. But with the K-switch, you have these um, kappa opioid receptors, mm -hmm. right, which are these inhibitory receptors which are found in very high concentrations in this small part of the brain that's underneath the cortex called the colostrum, this quite thin sheet uh, of, of cells, but projects to all different regions of the cortex and it the colostrum has well its role is still not fully understood mm -hmm. um, there are still conferences that go on every few years dedicated to understanding the colostrum it's it, kind of a isn't uh, there a it, group that says that it's the seat of consciousness there's one group that says right yeah 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 that that's go back to goes back to Francis Crick. Yeah, yeah, uh, Crick, Francis yeah, Crick yeah. thought that the, the colostrum was the seat of consciousness yeah. I don't know if that's true but what we know is that the colostrum it sits there it, it, it connects to all these bi-directionally has these bi-directional connections to all these different regions of the cortex and it has this overall kind of global inhibitory control it inhibits the cortex uh, it keeps the cortex under control and also orchestrates its activity mm -hmm. it helps the cortex move from state to state as you're constructing your model of, of reality. So I, I describe it in the book, I think quite reasonably, as like the conductor of an orchestra. Mm -hmm. Like the, the conductor is, 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 is telling which instruments to, to play a bit more loudly, mm -hmm. the other ones, whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, you know, yeah. and it's, it's maintaining the flow of the music uh, and the control of the orchestra. So your brain is like the orchestra and the conductor is the claustrum. 
Uh, and what you're doing with it's what salvanorin does. It binds to these kappa opioid receptors in these these clostral neurons, these neurons in the clostrum, and quietens them down. It shuts them down. And so it releases that control. It's like shooting the conductor in the head, I describe it. Um, and so the, the, the orchestra then just goes out of control. The brain no longer has this global inhibitory control. It's disinhibited. It's a release mechanism. Mm. It's the opposite of uh, what the classic psychedelics do. They kind of directly stimulate certain la layers of the cortex, mm. whereas what the salvanorin does, it, it shuts down that inhibitory orchestrator, that, that conductor, that control center, and, and pulls away that, that mechanism. It's this release mechanism. And that releases the cortex, um, and you get these entirely novel, new, emergent patterns of, of activity, which is experienced as this reality-shattering, extremely bizarre worlds experienced uh, that, you, uh, that you experience. Under it is extremely bizarre. Yeah. And I, I swear to you, mm. I was like, that's my lesson there. It's like, no, if you tell me to take Salvi again, I won't. <laughs> have you taken it? I have, but not in the kind of the pure form. Uh -huh. As in Salvanor in the crystal, I don't think many people have. Uh -huh. So in the so there's this kind of an interesting story with 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 Salvia, because up until well, I think it was the early '90s, we didn't know. I've got the date in my book, but I've forgotten it. Annoyingly, um, we didn't know. We knew that Salvia was psychoactive and psychedelic that it could be smoked mm -hmm. uh, to get a psychedelic effect. But we weren't aware of what was actually going on in there. What, you know, what, what, what was the, uh, the, the, the active component? And a, a guy called Daniel Siebert, mm -hmm. who was kind of an independent ethnobotanist, chemist, ethnopharmacologist, whatever you want to call him, he was working with salvia. He developed a kind of a keen interest in salvia divinorum. And he isolated this molecule um, sal turns out to be salvanorin A, mm -hmm. um, and he he did a Hoffman. He thought I will try an Albert Hoffman. He, yes, I'll try just a tiny amount, <laughs> uh, which t t you know, like a you know, two milligrams of this extract. You know, it turned out that the extract was like ninety percent pure oh salvanorin or something. So it was a bicycle. So it, 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 <laughs> it was a it was another. It was a kind of yeah, kind of like that. And he, yeah, he smoked two milligrams of this, which he thought was the tiniest amount possible. Same mistake as Albert Hoffman. And um, he had the most, you know, the, the, he had the most appalling uh, reality tearing experience. Uh, and and he, he, kept, he went through all these different worlds. He thought he completely lost any contact any concept of his original existence as a human or any kind of human existence was gone. And he was in these appallingly strange worlds. He finally came back and he scratched onto a piece of paper. He said, this is, um, what did I write in the book? This is tearing, this is madness. This is tearing apart the fabric of reality. And that's, I think perfectly describes what Salvanorin does. It tears apart the fabric of reality. It it removes all um, all of your moorings um, from your original world are gone ferociously, mm -hmm. ferociously, uh, with without any mercy. Mercy, no mercy. Yes, yeah. yes, no mercy. And there's an existential, I describe it in the book as an existential absoluteness mm -hmm. about the salvia space when you're in there deep. Once you're in there, that reality is the only reality mm -hmm. that there ever was. There's no sense that you've just come from a human existence and you're visiting this space. No, no, no. You've always been here. This is the only reality that there has ever been been and you're you're here forever <laughs> yeah that's that's it that's and, a and scary it's the most appalling place <laughs> yeah that's that's yeah. the scary part of it i thought i was going to be yeah. rolled into the 2d structure forever that's it you know it's yeah. like, and that's the scary mm. part of it can you contrast uh mm. the um then the uh that switch with the classic switches that we have the c switch 
Yes. So, so with, with salvia, as I said, it, it's the release mechanism. Mm -hmm. you're, release, you're disinhibiting the cortex. Mm -hmm. With the, what the classic psychedelics are doing is they, rather than activating inhibitory receptors, so the, the kappa opioid is an inhibitory receptor, it's mm -hmm. inhibiting the clostrum, uh, you're working directly on the cortex mm -hmm. with the classic. So the classic switch, you're activating these 5-HT2A receptors, which are heavily expressed in um, layer 5, so the cortex has, as you know, six layers that mm -hmm. we've identified, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and these deep layers go from one at the, the out, outermost. Uh, the deepest layer is levels, layer six. Mm -hmm. Then layer five, you have a very high concentration of these 5-HT2A receptors. And psychedelics, classic psychedelics, they selectively, unlike serotonin, which obviously interacts with all the different types of receptors, um, the, psych the classic psychedelics specifically, not 100% specifically, not 100% selectively, but quite selectively, they bind to and activate these 5-HT2A receptors. And thus they stimulate, rather than inhibiting, they stimulate directly this layer of cells in this deep layer of the cortex. And what that does is it allows information to start it excites these neurons, first of all. It makes them more likely to fire. It makes them more likely to uh, transmit information to other neurons. So you start, to get in, you start to get the spread of information out of these well-demarcated and well-defined networks that are defined by neural connectivity that normally keep your world model um, kind of not rigid, but they keep it well-structured. Um, they keep it stable and adaptive so that your brain can make sense of, of the model that it's building, so that it can make sense of the environment. It allows information, it, it shakes up that model by allowing information to flow out of these networks. And so you, you, it's like, uh, I describe it as like a heating up a piece of glass. Um, it's first, it's very, very rigid and solid. As you heat it up, it starts to become soft and more flexible, and it can reach new states. So that's what happens with the classic psychedelics, is your, your brain starts to be able to reach states outside of its normal state repertoire. That limited number of states within the cortical state space, what I call the world space, mm -hmm. it allows your brain to reach. It flattens this attractor landscape. Right. Um, and allows your brain to, the, your cortex, to reach out of, of, of its normally quite well-defined district within this um, attractor landscape, yeah. the state space. Yeah, um, um, uh, yeah. I, I remember that um, Carhart Harris and Tristan actually wrote the Rebus model, right? Relaxed beliefs uh, under psychedelics. And it was actually a beautiful model because uh, it basically it shows how when you relax the beliefs, you're basically climbing out of that of the uh, uh, energy minima of the attractor, right? And allows you to be able to change your belief systems while on the psychedelics. And, you know, uh, for our yes. audience here, the classic psychedelics are like LSD, mescaline, you know, uh, DMT is uh, listed under, uh, cla under classic psychedelics. Um, and um, yeah. um, what's uh, interesting uh, about this is that, you know, I, I I have just been in conversations with addiction specialists recently, and they seem not to get that um, you know this classic psychedelics are, uh, are non-addictive, right? Uh, and and um, uh, it's like oh mm -hmm. you know all psychedelics are addictive, and it's just like the the, the for me the mentality of uh, you know illness medicine physicians and not understanding what mechanisms there are. And so on. I said, well, you know, um, uh, uh, when I start explaining, these are uh, tryptamine derivatives, you know, they're not really, they're not really addicting. I said, if you're taking a look at phenethylamine derivatives, maybe yes, because then, then you're, you're looking at, you know, all of these methamphetamines and, and all of that that are highly addictive stuff. Yeah. Um, now, uh, a little bit on the terpenes, uh, Andrew, if you could uh, comment on the yes. world building capacity of terpenes. Like, uh, I, I have never yeah, taken so, Belladonna. Mm, <laughs> me either, me either. I, I'm, in, I'm in no hurry <laughs> to try that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the, the tropane, so we're talking about, in the old world, the, the witching herbs like mandrake mm -hmm. and Belladonna, mm -hmm. um, these contain, and, and in the new world, Datura, 
Yeah, Victoria Mattel. Yeah. And Brugmansia, these other um, ritualistic herbs that are used to enter other worlds, but very different other worlds than mm. what you experience with the tryptamines. And the what so the way these work, they contain a number of alkaloids. The main one that's probably responsible for the psychoactive effect, the psychedelic effects, uh, is the um, the scopol is scopolamine, mm -hmm. um, which is this tropane alkaloid, which is which works completely differently to the, the classic psychedelics. So uh, it's it's how's best to explain. So your brain as as you just kind of mentioned, is this predictive machine. Mm. Your, your brain is making predictions, but it has a model, a working model of the environment. It uses that model to try and... Um, to, it tests the model, basically, against sensory information. It says, if this model is working correctly, I should be able to predict what's going to happen in the next moment. I should be able to predict the next pattern of sensory information right. that's entering my brain. So if I've got a model of this pencil moving across the screen, my brain has a very good model of how this is moving. But it doesn't really need to absorb much of the sensory information because it already knows. If it does that, then your brain has a bit of an issue. It has to update its model. So your brain is always making predictions and attempting to, um, to quell to quash, um, to filter out sensory information. Because sensory information, is, it's expensive to process. Right. You have to stimulate all of these neural pathways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, neural connections aren't cheap. They're not. You know? and so you have these, yeah. The natural, so the natural collimation of uh, sensory data, right? Uh, I remember, um, uh, you know, uh, Einstein's famous uh, line is like, uh, you mean when I look at the moon, it isn't there? Well, you know, it just yeah. Yeah, it just gets data collected, and you know because right. you know uh, you know looking again at it again, you know you have to stimulate the the, the senses again, and so it has to create models of uh, of all of these things, um, and and right. then and then minimize the prediction error. So what does scopolamine right, exactly. do to that? Yes. Yeah, so so when the predictions are wrong when there's a, an error as you say you get this prediction error and it's only the prediction errors that are transmitted up through mm -hmm. the cortical hierarchy into the cortex and then used to kind of update the model so your brain changes the model if it gets the prediction wrong your brain uses the prediction error as a testing signal and it updates its model alters its model very very in a very fine finely tuned kind of way subtle mm -hmm. way uh, until those prediction errors go down again. So it starts to um, become more successful again in, in, in making predictions. Right. So that's your basic, your basic that's, predict, your, that's predictive coding. Yeah, your, your Bayesian priors are updated, right? Your assumptions about... Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So you, you're updating those priors. You're updating those, those predictions. Um, so, but those... The, the problem the brain has, and it's quite a major problem, is that... All of what we're saying now, that, that kind of framework, assumes that these sensory information is always going to be perfectly reliable. So if there's a, a prediction error, that must be because the sensory information um, uh, is, is correct, but the model must be wrong. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's not always the case. Sometimes the sensory information itself is flawed. Um, so it might be very noisy sensory information. Perhaps it, you're in, it's nighttime and it's foggy and you're trying to make sense of the world. Um, and the sensory information, you can't really trust it. Or if you're talking to someone over a very noisy, long distance telephone line, mm -hmm. you, you can't necessarily trust. Sensory information is inherently noisy and it's inherently unpredictable. So there's no way your brain could ever 100% perfectly predict sensory information. So your brain has to strike this balance between how much do I trust my model, which has been working perfectly well up till now, versus how much do I trust the sensory information and the prediction errors. Mm -hmm. So if there's a prediction error, is it because my model is not working, so I need to update the model? Mm -hmm. Or is it because the sensory information is somehow flawed or noisy? Mm -hmm. And the way that this balance, your brain is always trying to find the optimal balance. And 
one way it does that is to adjust the volume on these pre uh, prediction errors. If it trusts the sensory information, it turns up the gain, mm. turns up the volume on mm. these sensory prediction errors, uh, so, which means they flow into the brain and it, adopt, uh, it updates the model if it really trusts the sensory information. But sometimes it doesn't trust the sensory information. If it's dark and foggy or whatever, or it's, it's a particularly noisy telephone line, it doesn't trust the sensory information. It can turn the volume down on the prediction errors and shift the balance more towards trusting your model. Mm -hmm. um, so the tropanes, what do they do? Um, one of the volume switches or volume knobs on uh, prediction error volume mm -hmm. uh, is uh, the, this receptor called the acetylcholine muscarinic mm -hmm. 1 receptor, the M1 mm -hmm. receptor. Mm -hmm. This and what the brain does, it releases acetylcholine onto these receptors, and that stimulates the neurons that are transmitting these error signals. So it increases the volume uh, on the error signal. So if your brain really trusts the sensory information, it will um, in increase the volume by releasing acetylcholine. What the tropanes do is they bind and they block their M1 antagonists. So they bind to this M1 receptor. They don't do anything, uh, but they block acetylcholine's um, effect on these receptors. So you're mimicking a state where the brain doesn't trust sensory information at all. And so it's not updating its model based upon any kind of prediction error. And so your model, the balance becomes tipped so far towards trusting the model uh, that it eff effectively becomes disconnected mm -hmm. from the environment which means it can take on, it can start, no longer, it's no longer being held accountable to sensory information. It's no longer being modulated by sensory information in the normal way. And so the model can become completely unmoored from the environment and can become, can start to drift. Uh, it kind of drifts off into new spaces and it, these are never corrected. Mm -hmm. um, I talk a lot about this phenomenon of phantom smoking mm -hmm where when you, if you, there are videos on the internet, like police videos of like this young couple of young guys who thought they'd take Belladonna or something for fun. And they, they started freaking out. They were in the police station. You can see them smoking. There's no cigarette there, but they're smoking. Uh, and they do that for a long period of time. This is very common. Um, and what's going on here? It's like, well, it's in their brain, um, the, the brain's world model contains a cigarette that they are smoking, um, but it's completely disconnected from the sensory information. So they've maybe had a thought, you know, did I just light a cigarette? Um, maybe if they're a smoker, did I just light a cigarette? Normally you would say, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly, that model would be extinguished, the cigarette model. Uh, but with the, in the tropane state, the model is never corrected. So you have a thought, did I light a cigarette? Maybe I did. Your brain effectively inserts that cigarette, incorporates it in part of your world model in just the same way as it would when you were normally smoking a cigarette. Um, but it's never corrected. And so you continue experiencing the world as if it contained the cigarette. Now, you can then expand that and imagine, well, what if uh, I imagined um, a, a party going on in my room? You know, there, there are these, if you go onto Erowid, erowid.org mm -hmm. yeah. site, you can read the trip report of yeah. people who have taken tropane. And they will describe going to their, their dorm room at university, at college, and having all these people having conversations, long conversations about wild topics, about butterscotch, and, <laughs> um, you know, run it, you know, being naked, everyone being naked in the room and just having an orgy or something. And then after what could be 10, 20, 30, it could seem like hours, they suddenly realize that none of this happened. Um, it was all, so it's like a waking dream. In the dream state, again, your brain is disconnected. You're not, it's not held accountable to sensory information. So the world can kind of drift and move and shift from state to state. Right. Um, fueled by emotion, fueled by random patterns of neural activity, fueled by imagination, all these things, you know, the, the world. And so it's like you're in a dream, but you're fully awake.
at the same time. I see. That's the tropane stuff. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. that's a scary tropane. Uh, it's just like, yes. uh, for me, uh, the way I, I remember it is just, it's just like, uh, you're unwilling to exonerate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the perpetrator, uh, even if there's uh, DNA evidence uh, already contrary to the fact that, that you know, he wasn't there. Uh, at the scene of the crime, so uh, right, it's exactly. like you cannot change your belief system otherwise, um, which is exactly which is yeah. so different from from uh, you know a, a classic uh, psychedelic, which loosens all of those uh, all of those beliefs. Um, let's uh, now um, do do the last one, which is a special K. I mean, hey, yeah, who who has a, who who in his right mind ha wouldn't like to go into a K hole, but. <laughs> That is a yes. NMDA, man. So, um, that was yeah, an NMDA separate. antagonist. Yeah. yeah, so NMDA receptors, again. So, NMDA, um, like ketamine, particularly PCP, uh, these are the drugs we're talking about. Uh, again, uh, these have a completely different mechanism. Yeah, a aerial cyclohexylamines, right? Uh, what's the mechanism? Yes. So these uh, aryl cy cyclohexylamines, uh, they bind to the NMDA receptor. Mm -hmm. So the NMDA receptor, this is probably the most complex in some ways uh, of all of the, the, the well, uh, of the four switches that I discuss in the book. Yeah, that's why I, because I it said it last. To... <laughs> that's why I said it last. last. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so NMDA receptors, so they are found particularly, um, let me try and get this right, it's a long time since I wrote the book. Um, so NMDA receptors mm -hmm. are like, uh, they're, they're excitatory receptors, similar to, but not quite the same as AMPA receptors. So AMPA receptors are glutamate receptors normally, uh, and they are used to... Um, to stimulate neurons. So glutamate binds, sodium uh, and other cations sometimes come into the neuron and this depolarizes the neuron. Um, and NMDA receptors are a little bit more com complicated than that, but it's basically the same principle. You have glutamate binding um, and then sodium enters the cell mm -hmm. and it depolarizes the neuron. Um, now, NMDA receptors are found in particularly high concentrations mm -hmm. on these this group of neurons called inhibitory interneurons, which are found throughout well the entire brain. So in the brain, you have this balance between excitation and inhibition, and that balance is very very important. If it's if if there's only excitatory connections in the brain, uh, then your whole brain would light up uh, and there was there would be no way to control so you always have these inhibitory connections inhibitory interneurons that sit between the excitatory neurons and and keep them under control they control the patterns of activity uh, of the cortex they're, they're they're often connecting mm -hmm. to hundreds of different neurons at once and just making sure that the neurons don't go wild so to speak all right andrew let's now uh, go to one of the most complex switches, uh, reality switches out there, which is ketamine, which belongs to the aerial cyclohexylamine class. And I know that um, this is going to be a complex uh, uh, conversation, but please uh, enlighten us on how this switches a reality. Yes, so, so ketamine, uh, PCP, um, these are the... the the uh, aryl cyclohexylamine molecules that most people are reasonably familiar with, uh, they, they, they are psychedelic at low doses, uh, but then they shift, and I'll talk about a little bit about how that works, they shift to a more dissociative anesthetic effect at high doses. So they have this kind of plateau of effects. But at low doses, uh, what they're doing is they're, they're what's called NM, NMDA, antagonists. Mm -hmm. So the NMDA receptor is this excitatory receptor. So it's, it's, a, it's a receptor that stimulates neurons. It's a glutamate receptor. Mm -hmm. um, glutamate binds um, and something else goes on with magnesium, but forget about that. And sodium ions enter the cell uh, and this, the neuron, and this stimulates, it depolarizes the neuron and, and, and increases its, its excitability. 
ability, makes it more likely that it will fire. So, uh, so overall, NMDA receptors, they stimulate the cortex, they stimulate the brain. Now, the NMDA antagonists, they block the NMDA receptor, um, so they stop that stimulatory activity, and yet, and this is the great paradox. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, it used to be a bit of a paradox. They actually cause an increase in cortical activity. They don't decrease it. You would expect that when you block the NMDA receptor, which is a, an excitatory receptor, um, mm-hmm. you, would, you would dampen down. You would get perhaps more of an, an um, uh, a sedative effect, but you don't. You actually get at low doses, you get a stimulatory effect, which is actually psychedelic. Mm-hmm. And now the reason for this is because... So in the brain, you have two broad types of neurons. You've got many types of neurons, of course, but broadly you can, you can group them loosely into two categories, the excitatory neurons. So these are the ones that are stimulating each other. These are the ones that are transmitting information and constructing your experienced world model. And then sat between them, you have these often quite branched little neurons called inhibitory interneurons mm-hmm. they sit between the neurons and what they are doing is they are controlling they are quieting the activity of the excitatory neurons um, and helping your brain to regulate what's called the excitation inhibition balance the ei mm-hmm. balance which mm-hmm. is very important mm-hmm. you have to have a balance in order to are control these, are your these activity GABA, are these gaba interneurons these are gaba releasing mm-hmm. interneurons mm-hmm. yes okay. So, um, so what's interesting is that these NMDA receptors are found not only on excitatory neurons, but they're also found on inhibitory interneurons. So mm-hmm. you can stimulate inhibitory interneurons with glutamate binding to these NMDA receptors. And this, of course, will quieten neural activity because you're activating the inhibitory interneurons, mm-hmm. which then suppresses the excitatory interneurons. You have to go through a couple of steps right, to get to right, that. Right. But then when at low doses, um, the NMDA antagonists, they tend to preferentially uh, bind to the NMDA receptors on um, inhibitory interneurons. So they are quieting the inhibitory interneurons um, preferentially at low doses, which releases. So you get this release mechanism again. You're disinhibiting then these ex- excitatory neurons in the cortex, mm-hmm. um, which causes an increase in cortical activity, which is experienced um, in not quite the same, but kind of similar to what the psychedelics are doing. The psychedelics, again, are they're stimulating the cortex of these particular layers. So NMDA antagonists are doing something slightly different by inhibiting by antagonizing the NMDA receptors on these inhibitory interneurons. Yeah, so, so called excitatory in, effect overall. Inhibiting the inhibitor, therefore causing excitation. Inhibiting the inhibitor, inhibitor. yeah, so yeah. disinhibition yeah. is the term we yeah. would use, yeah. Minus, yeah. minus. It's kind of equals, interesting. Yeah, minus, 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 equals minus, plus. minus, <laughs> yeah. That's the way to think about it, yeah, minus, <laughs> minus equals plus. plus. Yeah, and what's, what's interesting is that it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting question as why does ketamine, for example, tend to bind on the inhibitory interneurons preferentially? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, it's to do with something called uh, use dependence, um, which basically means that, so the, the NMDA receptor is very complicated, as you know, um, and it tends to be, it tends to open, it can only kind of really open when the, the, the neuron within which it's embedded is is slightly depolarized Mm -hmm. uh, because it has to release this magnesium ion from the channel ketamine Mm -hmm. can only bind when the channel is in the correct state when the neuron is kind of depolarized so when the the neuron is being used um Mm -hmm. uh, and active and Mm -hmm. an inhibitory interneurons they tend to fire quite at quite a high rate constantly so they're mm-hmm. kind of constantly being used, if you like. So mm-hmm. ketamine has much more of an opportunity, whereas these pyramidal cells, for example, um, in the cortex, they tend to fire briefly for little bursts of activity, and then they'll be quiet again. So there's less opportunity for ketamine to kind of bind to those NMDA receptors. So that's why 
at low doses at least, they tend to bind to inhibitory interneurons and disinhibit the cortex. Now, as you increase the dose, so at this low dose, you have this kind of dissociative psychedelic effect. As you increase the dose, you start to start, you, you begin to uh, affect the excitatory neurons themselves. You go mm. from disinhibiting the cortex by inhibiting the uh, inhibitory interneurons to directly inhibiting the excitatory um, um, uh, neurons in the brain. In the and cortex. this is dose dependent, and, right? This, this is dose this dependent. This is dose dependent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there you get this, you, you get this low plateau of psychedelic effects. And mm -hmm. then when you start inhibiting the excitatory neurons themselves by blocking the NMDA receptors on those neurons, then you shift to this overall uh, depressant effect or anesthetic effect. And because of this push and pull between disinhibition and excitation, you get this quite unusual pattern of neural activity. This temporal pattern of neural activity starts to emerge where the brain shifts. And people have measured this using EEG. It shifts mm -hmm. every few seconds from this high complexity state, this highly active psychedelic state, and then down to this low complexity, low activity, anesthetized state. Boom, boom, back and yeah, forth right every few seconds. It's oscillating. And that is okay. experienced. Yes, it's kind of oscillating every few seconds. And that is experienced as this, not like a normal anesthetic effect where you just kind of go to sleep or yeah. become more and more unconscious. But you are in this weird state where you're both awake and then asleep and then awake, and that merges. So you get this unusual state of consciousness emerges from that, where you are both dissociated, disconnected from the environment, in, uh, but also at the same time, um, kind of aware and in this alternate world. So it's, it's, it's another way, if you like, of allowing the brain to start constructing alternate worlds, you know, new worlds mm. begin to emerge that, that aren't being held accountable to sensory information. So when you are oscillating that way, is that when you feel yourself in a in the hole or how how does that relate to the K hole itself? We well we, we don't actually know a hundred percent what the K hole represents. The K hole, people who don't know, is when you normally it's when you accidentally overdose. Because the margin of error with ketamine is is normally quite small, so mm -hmm. people will they will normally a little line of ketamine, perhaps if they're at a party, right? Because it's good mm -hmm. for dancing. That 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 slightly stimulated uh, sensory enhancement, that's that low level psychedelic effect, is quite good for for dancing. But if you take slightly too much, you start to dip uh, into that. Mm. anesthetic realm uh, and the further you go you know over that threshold the more anesthetized it becomes the more um dissociated you go go from the environment and we think that that is probably what represents uh, the k-hole state is when um you're accidentally i, I describe it as slipping you slip into a k-hole sure. Um, most people don't um, call it a K-hole unless it's kind of accidental. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're deliberately using it to access these other worlds, that would just be kind of the next stage, um, the next fa the next plateau that you're trying to reach. But most people, they kind of, they're, they're kind of uh. bobbing, bobbing along quite nicely and then shoo, they slip into this, this different uh. domain. And, and the more you take, of course, the stronger that sensation um, becomes, the more you become dissociated, the more you become disconnected from the environment. And there is some evidence that was published very, very recently that you're actually um, selectively um, uh, inhibiting certain neurons. You are activating neurons that are important for uh, constructing the world model, but you're inhibiting neurons that are important for 
connecting your brain. There are, there are those sent those prediction error neurons. Yes, you, you start mm -hmm. to inhibit those more selectively, whilst um, allowing these um, neurons that aren't connected to the environment, the ones that are constructing your world model, they remain active. And so you get this this process of more uh, of more and more complete disconnection from the environment as those error signals start to um, start to go you know, lower and lower and lower and become more and more diminished until you become completely disconnected from the environment. And then just like with the tropanes, in a way, you are in you're in a, an entirely novel world that has no relationship or no connection to the environment. Yeah, um, um, it, you know, w when I was looking at this, uh, uh, there was a study, I think it was done on sheep and um, where they yeah. were looking at, <laughs> right? Uh, I saw and, this, yes. Yeah, and, and, and that actually what was interesting to me about ketamine was that, you know, uh, you know that in deep meditators, um, there's an oscillation between the theta and gamma. Um, uh, waves and the front of the brain is a strong theta and the back of the brain is a strong gamma. And they find out that when you're on ketamine, it's the same thing. They say they find the same theta gamma oscillation. So I said, wow, this could be a you know, meditation molecule at the right dose. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, right? It was like, In the sheep it's... study, sorry, the, the sheep study is kind of interesting. What they saw, I, I don't necessarily, they the, the the headline, you know, the, the the clickbait headline was that they discovered the the neural the neural signature of the K hole. What mm -hmm. they saw is that as they increased the dosage in the sheep, they got these brief epochs, these brief periods mm -hmm. where neural activity seemed to stop. Um, you would get the EEG would almost flatline. Uh, you would see no neural activity at all, and they said that's the K hole. Um, I'm not 100% convinced. I'm not sure. Perhaps that would be a really anesthetized, extremely dissociated yeah. state. But I'm not. I'm, I'm not convinced it represents what most people, uh, is, or what's going on in most people's brains when they 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 describe what they call a K hole. I think the K hole is it's a little bit removed. That's pretty extreme when neural activity. Mm -hmm shuts down temporarily yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure you'd even be conscious at well you probably wouldn't be conscious at all mm -hmm. uh, in that state and the k-hole doesn't seem to be a state of just um losing consciousness but it seems to have uh, it has structure it has character there's awareness there but it's extremely dissociated it's extremely different to the the, the low level psychedelics so i don't think k-hole is actually well defined it's more of something people describe mm -hmm. rather than we've been able to pinpoint exactly uh, at what I, point it happens i think the desirability for it for me is that if you just have the right blip for like a minute or two in there mm. when you get out of it you feel this instant reset of your brain and mm. it's just like everything just goes out someone flips the switch off and then flips the switch on like a minute later. And for, for yeah. me, it just feels very refreshing to uh, mm. not have anything in there at all, right? Uh, and, and, and um, you know, I've, I've sent some of my, uh, my depressed patients for um, uh, ketamine therapy, those uh, treatment-resistant depression drug, right? Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, and I always envy the fact that when they come back to me, it's just like they're all this like, wow, they, they, they seem like they're totally reset, right? And of course, they have to be guided by a psychiatrist to do it and so on. But, you know, um, yeah, yeah. when they come back, it's like, they, you know, you can feel that mental reset. But anyway, speaking of GABA, you have a mm. wonderful article on Substack. And guys, uh, please follow Andrew on Substack. Um, why is fly agaric psychedelic? And, mm. you know, I have a special interest in the GABA receptor because everyone seems to focus on what I call the superstar neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, you know, and all of these wonderful neurotransmitters. Yes, no yes. one seems to be paying attention to that <laughs> break, to that major inhibitory mm. neurotransmitter. For me, it's just like, you know, they're the wireless signals, you know, glutamate is the excitatory signal, and then you have the... Uh, the, uh, the GABA, which is the um, uh, inhibitory signal. And 
you know, it was just, you know, I, I, I've been formulating, like uh, I, I formulated uh, a product recently that had um, uh, uh, nicotinoyl GABA, right? Uh, nicotinoyl GABA, which uh, is basically GABA that is complex with uh, niacin, right? So you could cross a blood brain barrier using mm. the GABA as a payload. Uh, because GABA is notoriously, uh, you know, a big molecule and cannot be absorbed, um, it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. But if you complex it with uh, niacin, you could actually pull it and and uh, have it hydrolyzed in the brain. And uh, that was my uh, endogenous ligand, basically GABA. And then mm. I put in a positive allosteric modulator, which was uh, CAVA, you know, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, here I use the, as I said, I don't like formulating with actual plants. I like to formulate with actual crystals. So uh, that's what I've been using. And I am proceeding, actually, which you didn't mention in the article, and we could talk about it now, is that, you know, you know, well, okay, everyone leaves GABA B alone. So let's talk about GABA A, right? And and uh, yes. uh, and all, all the wonderful things that that, that he said. It's like if you want, if you if you ask someone about GABA B, you just say, ah, just use for spasticity, and then everyone goes to GABA A because of the azabam, etc. Now the the thing that um that I was uh, looking at here was that you know the the effectiveness. Uh, for example, the um. Uh, the positive allosteric modulators would work only if there is the endogenous ligand or an orthosteric ligand present. You know, in that uh, in that article, for example, you could use uh, Massimol. I after hearing um, uh, Hamilton Morris pronounce it as Muskimol, and I was pronouncing it as Musimol. Uh, I looked at the pronunciation on the internet, and it's supposed to be Massimol. But it's from Amanita I Muscaria. say Muscimol, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's yes. from Amanita Muscaria, so it looks like Muscimol. But yeah. I, I said, well, okay, yeah. whatever. Muscimol it is. <laughs> um, but uh, it's an orthostatic ligand of the GABA receptor, right? And m my question is, mm. you know, uh, is the when you use positive allosteric modulators, like, for example, the GABA A receptor has the positive allosteric modulator sites for uh, benzodiazepines, for, for ethanol, um, you know, uh, and and uh, for even for progesterone, right? The neurosteroids, uh, they're in there. I, you know, I know this, Andrew, not because I'm an expert in this, but because I just gave a lecture on it in LA. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the 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 key the key thing that I wanted to know was that could this really work with uh, just uh, you know uh, low levels of GABA around, or if this works with the presumption that GABA is present, because. Um, you know, um, I, I, you know, if you if you look around, this is you know, in, in stat pearls, for example, which we use as clinicians, is positive allosteric modulators work by increasing the frequency with which the chlorine uh, chlorine channel opens when an agonist binds to its own site on the GABA receptor. So my assumption yeah. was that you actually needed the uh, orthosteric ligand or the endogenous ligand found before this would have any effect, or no, uh, is this not required? That's not an assumption I've always made. That's a good question. I, I, I don't know the definitive answer there. My understanding has always been that, well, okay, so let's think about the receptor, as you pointed out there, you, the receptor is always, always exists within a, an equilibrium of states. It's always shifting. And with some receptors, that's very, very complicated. You can get quite a number of states. We normally think of it as being open or closed, but as we both know, a receptor can actually exist often in a number of states, and it's, it's fluctuating uh, between them. It's shifting from state to state, and it sets up this equilibrium. And what an, allos what a, an agonist, first of all, is doing is it is increasing the likelihood or increasing the lowering the energy, if you like, of that open state mm -hmm. so it, it tends to spend more time in the open state during which chloride ions can pass through and um, an allosteric modulator a positive allosteric modulator is binding at a separate site away from the agonist binding site so it's not mm -hmm. an agonist it's not binding in the same way that GABA binds binding in a separate site and also distorting the protein the three-dimensional structure of the protein in some way, uh, twisting it out of shape. So again, it makes it more likely that it will be uh, that it will shift to the open state. Mm 
Now, I've never made the assumption, maybe I've been wrong like you, if, if this information is correct, I've never made the assumption that the, the endogenous agonist has to be there as well uh, for that to work. I imagine it would be enhanced if you have the, the endogenous, because then you've got two, um, you've got, you know, you've got two positive effects. You've got the, the, the natural agonist, and then you've got the, um, the allosteric, um, positive allosteric um, modulator. Um, now, it might be different for different receptors and for different allosteric modulators. So some mm -hmm. perhaps might well be able to directly um, shift the receptor into the open state. Others might, uh, might have some kind of use dependence. So it would be another case mm -hmm. of use dependence where it's only when the, the, the endogenous agonist is bound, um, then the allosteric modulator can bind and perhaps uh, increase the time the opening time, increase the, the, the duration of time uh, when the, the channel is open. That could, channel, I think yeah. there's, there's more than one way to allosterically modulate a receptor. And yeah. I imagine it will be different for both different receptors and for different allosteric modulators. So I don't think it's, um, it's, it's as clear cut as that. Yeah, it, it, you know, because it bothered me because I, um, I basically audited a lecture of someone from uh, MassGen and uh, essentially, it was there, you know, categorically stated, categorically stated uh, uh, you mm. know, which we as uh, researchers know, categorical statements are really very, very difficult mm -hmm. things to, to have in your head when you're doing um, a research or formulation. As you said, you know, a positive uh, allosteric modulators work only if there is uh, an agonist bound to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the GABA site. And, and I said, well, is this true, right? And then I look mm. around. Uh, for all the references, and it seems to be like, yes, it's actually, you know, it's what's uh, the accepted belief right now is that you should have something in there. Mm. So that in my formulation, I actually put in, uh, you know, an orthosteric ligand plus cavein as a positive allosteric modulator. And it works, mm. right, as an, uh, as an anxiolytic uh, very, uh, very well. But you know that cava, you know, would work. Uh, by itself, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's given us tea, you know, before they settle tribal wars in the Pacific Islands, right? Uh, to to calm you down. Uh, so, yeah. and I, I, I actually like uh, for for our audience here, you know, uh, in the, the GABA, GABA A receptor, there are uh, uh, sites that other than the site where the GABA agonist would bind or the GABA itself would bind, uh, called the cert modulators, and they are separate. For for example. Uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, there are separate uh, sites for for uh, other um, other molecules uh, to to bind in there, like uh, the zolpidem, uh, the other Z drugs would bind in there. And uh, mm -hmm. you know we know that different compositions of the alpha, beta, um, uh, gamma, delta, you know uh, subunits, they they produce different mm -hmm. things uh, uh, there, and depends on the degree of uh, binding. To like two subunits, right? Uh, any two subunits. Uh, you know what was interesting for me is that I actually never knew that a massimol, for example, was uh, uh, alpha four and delta, right? And mm. uh, from that, Andrew, what is the predicted effect of massimol other than seeing reindeers fly and, uh, and having the <laughs> having the having the origins of Christmas, you know, from uh, uh, copying the the the, uh, the cap of the Amanita muscaria of uh, red with white dots. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, the, the the Amanita muscaria. It's a fascinating mushroom. We actually don't know. I wrote, I wrote this article, as you said, on Substack. Why is fly agaric psychedelic? Just this last week, and um, there's still a lot we don't know about. Um, the pharmacology of this. What we know, as, as you just said, is that it, first of all, it, it doesn't produce the psychoactive effects that you would perhaps predict. Mm -hmm. if, you, if I told you, oh, it's a GABA, a positive GABA allosteric modulator, you might suggest, okay, it's going to be a sedative, like the benzodiazepines, or perhaps the Z drugs, or alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps it will create a, a feeling of drunkenness. Um, uh, loss of inhibitions, relaxation, and, and, uh, loss of anxiety, and all of those effects you do tend to get with Massimol. Um, but then, 
it also has this additional effect, which is more of a psychedelic effect, a visionary effect. People mm -hmm. experience uh, enhancements of their perception. They report having extremely vivid dreams where they see little elf-like being, beings that they communicate with and they ask advice from. Um, so it, it starts to look like a more like a psychedelic, um, but with additional um, sedative and um, um, other kind of properties that we would normally associate with the GABA um, activating drugs, these GABA positive GABA allosteric uh, modulators. So, so the question is, is why then? Mm -hmm. Why should a GABA activating molecule have visionary effects? We should expect the opposite. Right. Um, Mosimol was trialed once as a treatment for schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Because people thought that, well, it's it's activating it's it's activating GABA, so this perhaps should uh, perhaps quieten the brain. It should reduce um, the frequency or the intensity of auditory hallucinations, for example. But they saw the opposite; the, mm -hmm. the psychosis got worse. Um, so, so it really does seem to have these um, psychedelic properties, and that was um, something of a mystery for some time um, until. People started noticing, particularly with the Z drugs as well, which are mm. also, um, they work similar to the benzodiazepine, but they, they bind at different uh, GABA receptor subunits. And they also, in high doses, quite rarely, but very well documented, they can produce hallucinations in some people. So there seems to be something more going on with this GABA mm. activation. or and GABA. We, Yeah, we don't know the mechanism yet for that. Yeah, so, so we don't know the mechanism, and it's still a, a mystery. I, in the paper, um, I point out that, first of all, um, Mosimol binds to certain subunits that are ex expressed mm -hmm. uh, in certain receptor isoforms. And mm -hmm. importantly, different isoforms of these GABA receptors are located in different parts of the brain. Yeah. So you get not only... Um, subtype specificity, but actually brain area selectivity. Yeah, yeah. So these drugs will tend to bind to those GABA receptors in those parts of the brain that have those subunits. And mm -hmm. so with Mosimol, we know that it tends to accumulate, uh, it tends to bind particularly strongly to a particular type of GABA A receptor, a particular isoform that's mm -hmm. highly expressed, particularly in the thalamus. Um, which is, it's leading, it's kind of tantalizing, because we know that the thalamus is very important for the gating of sensory, sensory gating. information. In right. the, yeah, sensory right. gating. Gating. It's yeah. also important for unifying and controlling cortical activity. There are all of these, the thalamus has been described as like a seventh layer of the cortex that sits below layer six of the cortex. It's heavily mm -hmm. interconnected bi-directional mm -hmm. you have these thalamocortical loops so the cortex active cortical activity is very much under the control of the thalamus it's not just sensory gating of information mm -hmm. into the cortex but actually the construction of your world model also depends a lot on thalamic activity so my working very very rough hypothesis is mm -hmm. that perhaps by disrupting Thalamic activity selectively with Mosimol, um, you are disrupting sensory gating, so perhaps allowing um, the flow of information into the brain much more untrammeled than un unfiltered than it normally would be. But you're mm -hmm. also disrupting the, the, th the thalamic control over cortical activity. So this mm -hmm. might might uh, account for at least some of the visionary effects of Mosimol and also the the Z drugs like. Um, you know, Ambien, uh, Zolpidem, mm -hmm. things like that, yeah. Yeah, um, there are uh, actually three things that I wanted to note here. One is that uh, actually, um, um, during my conversation with Carl Kristen, he said, Ted, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you're looking at um, uh, GABA A receptors because, you know, GABA is actually, uh, I think, one of the key, if not the key molecule for uh, schizophrenia, right? Uh, and and the studies mm -hmm. of uh, treatment of schizophrenia. And well, I yes. would, how could I, how could I say no to the man, right? 
Um, <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I heard your, um, your um, uh, Hamilton Morris's experience with Gaboxidol. Uh, yes. I, yeah, I actually have tried Gaboxidol. Um, you know, I, 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 I had like a couple that came from Mexico, and this was a long time ago. And I took one gaboxidol just for sleep, and I could confirm uh, actually Hamilton Morris's experience of uh, like, holy wow. shit, this is actually psychedelic. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and um, uh, and for um, uh, uh, the. Uh, in terms of, of, of the, uh, uh, the other thing that you mentioned was of course the thalamus doing sensory gating. And I do remember someone actually saying that perhaps uh, this was the reducing valve that Aldous Hux Huxley was uh, looking for in the doors of perception. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. it was uh, precisely, yes. Yeah, um, it was kind of uh, neat like that. So anyway, we are uh, we have exhausted our three topics, uh, <laughs> and thank you so much for all the detail. Uh, and my final question is actually very simple: mm -hmm. What are the three things you recommend we all do to live life smarter, not harder? Oh, I can give you two and see okay. if you need the third. <laughs> um, so, yes, smarter but not harder. Well, I think the important thing, the, the, the advice that I would give to, I always, the advice I always give to young people who ask me, sometimes, occasionally, people come to me for advice, not very often, but occasionally when they do, I always say, um, as, as Bukowski allegedly said, find what you love and let it kill you. Um, <laughs> find what it is. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I love it. You never heard that? No, 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 no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> find what you love and let it kill you. I think that's great advice. You know, find what you I work usually out what kill the one I love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, second one. <laughs> yes. yes. So find out what you want to do with your life and work out how you can spend more and more time doing that until that's all you do. And then eventually let it kill you. Right. Um, that's the key advice. Uh, don't get trapped in um, doing something you don't want to do for the rest of your life. That's I think that's fundamental. Right. We're only here for a short time. So do what you love, I guess, is the, the, the pithy way of saying that. Secondly, I would say um, get to know plants, get to know psychedelic molecules. There is a whole I will say there's a whole world out there. There is a whole omniverse of other worlds out there. Um, Tread carefully. These are extremely astonishing substances. These are remarkable substances. They have immense power. Uh, but I think everybody now, we are in this new age, the psychedelic age, the second psychedelic age, really, the psychedelic renaissance. We're in a, a, a new, a whole new period of existence where um, we are discovering and rediscovering these remarkable and uh, bizarre and fascinating and important worlds that um, that we should be exploring with as much ambition and vigor as with which we reach with our rocket ships to the stars, as I, I say in the book. Um, I think that's, that's important. So getting to know psychedelics, getting to know, learn to use your nervous system is uh, what Tim Timothy Leary famously said, learn to use your nervous system. You are in possession of this, as I say in the book, this exquisite machine, this world building machine inside your head. Um, it is your responsibility, I think, um, to understand how it works, to understand it, uh, how you can actually learn to control it and to regulate it and uh, to manipulate its switches. And I think psychedelics are the um, the tools for, for doing that. So that's number two. Mm -hmm. Number three, mm -hmm. number three, um, 
I will go back to the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, that's a general one. <laughs> well, it seems that Asia is influencing you already, huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> well, what about uh, your, your eight years there now, thereabouts, right? Sorry? Uh, you're, you're, you're eight years now uh, in, in uh, Japan? Yes, eight years in Japan. It's starting to get into my, under my skin, into my brain. And, uh, <laughs> and the, <laughs> I can't complain about that, so yeah. You're, you're, you're getting to be, um, you know, um, uh, not, not only acculturated, but, you know, um, you're getting to have the, the, uh, the, the, the values that are uh, in there as well. And, I'm glad that you're very aware of what those values are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew. And uh, uh, we're going to put it, we're going to put this in the show notes. But um, uh, just uh, for our listeners here who are listening, where can people find you? Uh, yes, the first port of call would be my website, alieninsect.net. There you can find links to my interviews and my papers and some of my slideshows, you can find links to kind of check out my books. You can also buy my books if you wish directly from my website. You can download the first chapter of both uh, Alien Information Theory and Reality Switch Technologies, which of course you can also buy directly from uh, Amazon or from order from your local bookstore, however you like to do it. Um, Twitter, I'm very active on Twitter. My the handle is Alien Insects. I post regularly. I post threads on psychedelic neuroscience and the other the science and culture of psychedelics and other psychoactives. And uh, I have a weekly Substack newsletter where I write each week. I write a post and uh, a short article on the science and culture, mainly of psychedelics. Um, so if you want to sign up for that and have that delivered to your email address directly every weekend. Uh, please go to my Substack, Alien Insect on Drugs, um, where you can also read the, the, the articles that I've already written on there. Um, I'm also on Instagram, also Alien Insect, but I post less frequency, frequently on there uh, because of the nature of the work I do. I tend to be more written, so Twitter's a bit better. So follow me on Twitter, first of all, I would say. Perfect. Okay, I, uh, I, I follow it. you yes. on Twitter. And guys, uh, just as a last word here, even if you don't understand what he's saying in his books, just buy it for the art. It's incredible. <laughs> he does the art himself. And I swear when I saw the reality switch book, I said, this is fantastic art. The book itself is a work of art. Uh, second. Thank if, you very much. Yes. If, second, you know, uh, he's very modest. He says that, you know, um, uh, he writes for Substack and it could be understood by anyone. Actually, a, you know, scientists like me who are looking for um, uh, the newest information and the questions that, that uh, we are currently asking, Andrew is also asking, and you could see there a very, uh, not only a cogent explanation, but a very eloquent uh, uh, and on-point explanation of what we know, what we don't know, and how he proceeds uh, break, uh, basically building up the way he builds worlds, you know, from nothingness into something that's complex but comprehensible. So thank you so much mm. for your attention. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. This has been another episode of the Smarter Not Harder podcast. Smarter Not Harder is a major donor to Health Optimization Medicine and Practice Association, the educational nonprofit organization that teaches physicians and non-physician healthcare practitioners the standard of care in health, not the standard of care in disease. So can you help us by donating a bit of your time to spread the word? Head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your shows and leave us a five-star review. And while you're at it, please go to YouTube and click subscribe. Thank you for tuning in to Smarter Not Harder Podcast, your home for one-cent solutions to $64,000. Yeah.